Um, I think we can start now. Hopefully, uh, our broadcast via Facebook will now also be active. So um, let me welcome everyone to uh, today's webinar, um, which uh, will deal with um, the Taliban's conquest of Afghanistan and its impact on minority rights. Um, it's organized here by our Institute of Mi for Minority Rights at Eurac Research in Bolzano, Italy. And uh, we're hoping to shed some light on the most recent developments in Afghanistan with, uh, as mentioned, a special focus um, on the impact uh, on minorities and minority rights. My name is Katharina Krepatz. I'm a senior researcher at the Institute for Minority Rights, and I'm having the great pleasure of moderating today's event. Um, however, before uh, I go to introduce our speakers and uh, before we go into the topic of Afghanistan, um, please allow me to take a few moments to remember a, a very renowned colleague who unfortunately passed away this year and in whose memory we are also holding this webinar, uh, namely Kamran Arif. Kamran uh, was a senior advocate of Pakistan and an internationally recognized and highly respected human rights defender. He was also a former co-chair of the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan and on the board of the Democratic Commission for Human Development in Pakistan. He trained human rights lawyers and human rights defenders and also conducted many projects, including on the abolition of the death penalty, on the prohibition of torture and uh, on ending enforced disappearances. He was a firm believer in the value of human rights and human dignity, a great supporter of the rule of law, and was at the forefront of defending all those who were vulnerable within society, like minorities. So this is why we are dedicating uh, this event today um, to his memory and his work. Now, uh, before I come to our speakers, uh, just a few organizational details, um, both our speakers will uh, give a short presentation of about 15 minutes and uh, we will then have a shared uh, discussion um, for our participants in the audience. If you'd like uh, to ask a question then to our speakers, you can do so uh, by posting it in the chat and uh, my colleague Alexandra will collect the questions and, and forward them to me. So uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce our speakers who have kindly agreed to join us um, with their expertise on, on this very interesting and, and timely topic today. So our first speaker will be Professor Javid Rahman. He is a professor of law at uh, Brunel University in London, a former head of Brunel Law School and a member of Brunel Senate and founding director of the Center for Security, Media and Human Rights and interdisciplinary Brunel University Research Center. In July 2018, uh, he was appointed by the United Nations Human Rights Council as the Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the Islamic Republic of Iran. He has also worked closely with Kamran Arif on several human rights projects, including the collaborative project led by EURAC, entitled Europe-South Asia Exchange on Supranational Regional Policies and Instruments for the Promotion of Human Rights and Management of Minority Issues. Our second speaker uh, will be Dr. Zaid Shabab Ahmed. Dr. Uh, Ahmed is a research fellow at Alfred Deakin Institute for Citizenship and Globalization, Deakin University in Australia. He's also a non-resident research fellow at Institute of South Asian Studies, uh, National University of Singapore. And uh, during 2017 to 2019, uh, he was a non-resident research fellow um, with the University of Southern California's Center of Public Diplomacy. Uh, from 2013 to 2016, he was also an assistant professor at the Center of International Peace and Stability at the National University of Sciences and Technology in Pakistan. And his research focuses on political developments and groups um, such as democratization, authoritarianism and political Islam, and also interstate relations in South Asia and Middle East. So, um, without further ado, I would like uh, to give the floor to our first speaker, uh, to Professor Javid Rahman. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Katerina. Dear colleagues, I thank URAC and colleagues at URAC for allowing me this opportunity to speak uh, at this important and contemporary subject. I begin by paying my respects and remembering uh, Kamran Arif, 
the Pakistani human rights lawyer and a human rights defender. Uh, now turning to the subject itself, on 15th of August 2021, the Taliban triumphantly entered Kabul and seized control of the presidential palace as the former president, Mr. Ashraf Ghani, fled the country. Since that time, a range of claims are made, including that this Taliban regime has changed from the one that previously ruled uh, over Afghanistan from 1996 to 2001, that this new administration remains committed to bringing an inclusive government. There were suggestions, and there are indeed suggestions, um, that we should adopt a, a wait and see policy and allow the Taliban the time and the opportunity to establish a stable government. The Taliban themselves have since coming to power reiterated claims of never supporting terrorism and never allowing Afghanistan to be used for terrorist activities against another state. But there is an age old saying, according to which old habits die hard. <laughs> and there is precious little evidence to me um, that in the previous months, that Taliban are now a reformed entity and are respectful uh, of international law obligations. More specifically, in the context of human rights and minority rights obligations, the Taliban have used um, these in the parenthesis of what uh, is called the Sharia law. In reality, it is becoming increasingly obvious that all human rights, including the rights of women and minorities, are subject to their compliance with the Islamic religious moral code as the Taliban administration views Sharia law to be. Um, in its announcement of 7th of September 2021, the Taliban announced an interim government. This interim government is full of the Taliban veterans and old guard hard, uh, hardliners from the 1990s who had been engaged in battles with the US-led coalition for nearly two decades. The government is headed by Mullah Hassan Akhund an inter, as an interim prime minister. Akhund previously largely acted as a religious figure uh, and is also recognized for his strict Islamic ideology developed from the Deobandi Islamic school and is also recognized as one of the architects of the destruction of the Buddhist um, statues of Biman in March, 2000, uh, in, in March 2001. Akhund was part of the Sharia Council that advised the then Taliban leader Mullah Umar to order destruction of the 6th century statues despite considerable international pleas for non-destruction of this cultural heritage site. There were other names in this interim cabinet, um, the inclusion of which raises serious apprehensions and concerns. This includes the key position accorded to Mr. Sirajuddin Haqqani, who headed the much feared Haqqani network and is blamed for many kidnappings and deadly attacks. And what about the position of minority rights, human rights, and the claims of an inclusive government? None are obviously apparent, but in the statement providing for the establishment of the entire government, the rights of minorities, the underprivileged, and education are all made subject to, the, to and within the framework of the Sharia. No woman is included in the entire government, and the inclusion of Abdul Salam Hanafi, an ethnic Uzbek, named as a deputy to Mr. Akhund, is attributed more to his long time and long-term Taliban membership rather than any reactions to engendering ethnic or cultural diversity in a cabinet dominated by the Pakhtuns. The Talibans have clearly refused to show any interest in holding any form of elections or democratic governance. Now turning to the framework of the reference of the Sharia and the mode of governance of the new Taliban administration. The implementation of the Sharia, or in other words, the Islamic religious code, has been a consistent theme underlying the evolution of the Taliban in the early 1990s, when much of the old guard of the Taliban and the foot soldiers received their education in the madrissas of the then NWFP province um, in Pakistan. 
When the Taliban last took control of Kabul in September 1996, with the claim of enforcement of the Sharia and the establishment of an Islamic form of government, they unleashed an era of violence against religious and ethnic minorities. Uh, there was repression of women and they supported explicitly and implicitly a terror network and negated all forms of democratic avenues of governance. In their previous term in charge during, as I mentioned, 1996 to 2001, the Taliban launched the most vicious campaign to cleanse Afghanistan from their self-conceived, self-perceived uh, ideas of moral decadence. Women and minorities bore the burnt of this campaign. Women were not allowed to work or receive education, and access to healthcare was contingent on strict requirements being met, including only being able to attend facilities with male relatives and gender segregated healthcare establishments. Women were forced to wear burqas, which are full face coverings. They were banned from leaving their house without a, without a male chaperone. Any infractions from the above, including any showing of their skin in public resulted in serious punitive punishments, including floggings and public beatings. Adultery was punished by stoning to death. Taliban were particularly intolerant towards the ethnic Hazaras, a Shia minority group of Afghanistan. This was characterized by the campaigns of Mizar Sharif. During 1998, the Taliban captured Mizar Sharif, but, and I quote here, with substantial credible evidence of human rights violations occurring on a mass scale. Amnesty International reporting in September 1998 stated that according to testimonies from eyewitnesses and surviving members of the victims' families, Taliban had, and I quote here again, deliberately and systematically killed thousands of ethnic Hazaras, civilians, during the first three days following their military takeover of mizar sharif on 8th of August 1998. In November 1998, Human Rights Watch termed these executions as a killing frenzy, Human Rights Watch also noted pronouncement by the Taliban installed governor, according to which those Hazaras who remained in Mazar Sharif would be killed if they did not convert to Sunni Islam. Non Muslim minorities, in particular the Hindus and the Sikhs, as I shall consider shortly and briefly, faced a future of rampant persecution and disaster at the hands of these new religious masters. With such horrific review of the Taliban, you can legitimately question as to the reasons why the Taliban victory was so swift in taking control in August 2021. This is uh, complicated and we risk a digression. However, since being ousted in October 2001, the Taliban were in retreat but never fully defeated. They continued to fight in their strongholds and by the end of 2020, they had come to control or exert influence on in over 50% of the territory of Afghanistan. It is estimated that there were 8,820 casualties during 2020 alone, with 3,305 persons killed and 5,885 5, injured. These numbers included um, members of religious minorities. The Taliban were reported to be responsible for 45% of these civilian casualties. Taliban also reportedly issued punishments in areas under their control, applying their extreme Sharia Islamic law interpretations, and there have been increasing reports of killings and torture of ethnic Hazaras, uh, Shias, at the hands of the Taliban. So, what then is the future of the minorities in Afghanistan? In the intervening period of the two decades since 2001, there have been some, albeit limited, advances in minority and human rights. The 2004 Constitution of Afghanistan provided official status to Islam as the religion of Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. And while other religions were allowed by the constitution to exercise and performance of their religious rituals, 
This was limited to within the bounds of law and in the absence of any specific implementation mechanisms to allow for equality and non-discrimination for the minorities. There were limited gains. Uh, these limited gains, such as the recognition of 2009 of the Shia personal status law for the application to Shias, uh, accommodation of Shias in some key government and public positions, as well as a reserved parliamentary seat for the Hindus and Sikhs installed in 2016, now unfortunately remains at a serious risk of being displaced. Similarly, while the 2004 constitution recognized various ethnicities within Afghanistan, ethnic and linguistic, linguistic discrimination continues and has resulted in arbitrariness, exclusion, ostracization, and marginalization of these communities. So, would the Taliban interpretation of the Sharia have changed uh, 20 years since they were ousted from power? Doctrinally, not so much. And certainly, in my view, the new government is unlikely to accept the current international human rights and minority rights obligations. Despite some initial expressions of flexibility, the Taliban view of women and women's rights remains problematic, dangerous, and unacceptable. Women are being denied equality. They're being denied equality, equal rights in education, in employment, and access to health care. Uh, women will be forced to wear full face covering and Already we know that they will not be allowed to take part in any sports or recreational activities. Afghanistan's religious minorities also remain at a point of extinction. They face too many issues of non-discrimination and the remaining Hindus, Sikhs, Ahmadis and Baha'is are likely to continue facing persecution at the hands of the Taliban. There are over 200,000, oh sorry, there were 200, over 200,000 Hindus and Sikhs at the beginning of 1990s but their population now stands at the verge of extinction with less than 200 individuals remaining in Afghanistan of today. I have already highlighted my concerns at the reports of killings, torture and brutality that is being uh, perpetuated and that is being uh, conducted against ethnic um, minorities, in particular the Hazara Shias. Uh, finally, what can the international human rights institutions and the international community do to support the Afghans? It is important that the new administration, the Taliban, is judged by the international human rights standards and commitments that, that have been undertaken by Afghanistan as a state. This includes the ratifications of the international covenants, the Convention Against Torture, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and the Child Rights Convention. From what I've noted above, above, I am skeptical that the ideological position or the worldview of the old guards now in charge of Afghanistan would have changed or would have changed by any significant measure. But that said, Afghanistan has moved on. There is now a new generation of young people, women, religious and ethnic minorities. These, this newer generation is more familiar and more assertive of their fundamental human rights. Afghanistan can no longer be treated as the backyard and ignored until another catastrophe in the nature of 9-11 happens. The world must remain a focus on the human rights situation in Afghanistan. The Taliban need economic, financial and political support for their survival and the international community would do well to hold the Taliban to consistently account for the human rights and minority rights record. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Javid, for this um, very interesting and, and compre comprehensive overview of the situation of uh, minorities in, in Afghanistan and also for being perfectly on time with the 15 minutes. So. Uh, excellent, uh, excellently done. And um, so coming over uh, to our next speaker, uh, to Dr. Ahmed, I would now like to ask you for your um, take on the situation of, of minorities and the Taliban's rise to power in Afghanistan. 
Thank you, Katharina. Thank you to your work and uh, Professor Iman has actually uh, presented excellently, very hard act to follow, not just in terms of time management, but I'll try my level best to um, you know, complete my presentation within the given uh, uh, time frame. Uh, but also I think, uh, thank for, again, Yura for organizing this seminar in the memory of Kamran uh, Arif. Uh, was of course a senior lawyer and a prominent human, human rights activist in Pakistan. I had the pleasure first meeting him in Kathmandu at the Eurex, you know, summer school at which Professor Haman was also there and then stayed in touch with him afterwards. And it was always a pleasure to talk to him and then to listen to his experiences. I'll focus more on first uh, Taliban's ideology. Uh, Professor Haman to a degree has already covered this aspect, but I think I'll go deeper into the Deobandi uh, Islam and Deobandi school of thought for just for our audiences who are not familiar with this. So Deobandi Islam emerged in Indian subcontinent in 1867, uh, which was 10 years after a major uh, uprising against the British East India Company in 1857. So uh, this anti-colonialism has been at the heart of Deobandi's uh, school of thought and by virtue of that experience basically. Uh, and as it was, you know, the, founded in Deoband of today in Uttar Pradesh, that's from where the name comes from. Uh, and this school of thought had a very particular understanding of faith that the Deobandi brand of Islam adheres to uh, orthodox Islamism, you can call it, or uh, they are fundamentalists, basically. And they adhere to Sunni Islamic law or Sharia, and we have all heard Taliban consistently been talking about not making any compromise in relation to how they want to implement Sharia. So that's one aspect I think we have to keep in mind. And another aspect that when the Obandi tradition became the most popular school of Islamic thought, uh, it was mainly most popular among the Pashtuns. And, uh, and the Taliban are actually, you know, majority Pashtun, Pashtuns uh, who live um, <clears throat> on both sides of the Durian line, or you can say Afghanistan, Pakistan border. So now I'll focus on, uh, you know, I'm just saying for the sake of it that Taliban 1.0, because similar to what Professor Iman said, I'm not fully convinced that there is Taliban 2.0, but because I'm going to, uh, you know, make references to the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan that uh, existed from 1996 until 2001. So in terms of how they implemented Sharia, I think that's very important in terms of uh, to develop a fuller understanding of how, if they are going to repeat the same thing the next time around. So uh, during the time of the Islamic Emirate, the Taliban had prohibited, of course, uh, poor uh, alcohol, which is Haram and Islam, and they forbade music, television, and movies, as well as paintings and photography. So they, are, they go to that extreme as well. Then movie theaters were closed. Many of the movie theaters or cinemas, they had actually turned them into mosques. Uh, and of course, women were not allowed to, and girls to attend their educational institutions. Uh, and they were, of course, as Professor Iman talked about, you know, the persecution of uh, sectarian and religious minorities and so on. And especially the women suffered the most. So I'm quoting from the US State Department report. They suggested that after, because after the civil war, the emirate was established. So the dynamics, the women had already suffered a lot because of the civil war. So this US State Department report suggested that as many as 50,000 women who had lost husbands and other male relatives during Afghanistan's long civil war had no secure income. And especially with these increased restrictions during the Islamic emirate, they had no other way but to beg in the streets. Uh, to, to survive. And these were the realities of that time. Um, but in terms of, if I can think of any good thing that they did, uh, they banned the use of drugs around 2000. And it wasn't in 1996. And the reason that they banned them in 2000 was also because, you know, the uh, international market for the drugs, you know, were, uh, had faced some challenges because the prices had gone down. So for the Taliban, it wasn't that lucrative sort uh, kind of a thing to sell drugs. And then of course, we know what happened after uh, the 9-11 and the Taliban were uh, defeated. And the Taliban were not just defeated alone by the international troops. There was this Northern Alliance resistance 
that also helped the international troops. And interestingly, what happened after 2001 was that the international community worked on disarming the Northern Alliance. While they were disarming Northern Alliance, the Taliban, they were reorganizing across the border in Pakistan and they returned to the battlefield around 2005 and six, when the US was also already distracted towards the war in Iraq. And as you had given me uh, the theme of failure of democracy and governance in Afghanistan, I think these are very important uh, issues that we need to discuss. That what happened during the past two decades, you know, uh, we're talking about trillions of dollars of investment in uh, democratization, in building, you know, enough kind of security infrastructure and so on. So what went wrong? Uh, that deserves a lot of attention in my opinion. Uh, but first, I, I'll focus on the U.S. Taliban peace deal, which in itself wasn't democratic because the Ashraf Ghani government wasn't a party. Maybe the U.S. thought they are spoilers, so they were not included in the agreement. Um, and in the peace deal itself, that allowed the Taliban to get thousands of their prisoners released, and they went back to fighting. Uh, so they, this deal uh, was a failure uh, uh, from the very start um, as well. And then we have to focus on the Taliban's narrative. While they were capturing the country piece by piece, region by region, the narrative was that they are fighting against the most corrupt government. And the international evidence also showed that this was actually one of the most corrupt governments uh, in Afghanistan. And why the international community ignored it, that's another uh, question that deserves more attention because the Taliban greatly benefited from it. And there was virtually no resistance other than what happened in Panjshir. Uh, I think that's where they faced uh, one of the serious resistances. But in other parts, it was kind of, you know, like a smooth, uh, uh, or uh, you can say without any resistance, the Taliban managed to capture the country. And then with reference to, again, uh, democracy elections, I think deserves more attention than what happened during elections in Afghanistan. So in 2018 elections, there were 13,000 official complaints of irregularities in the electoral process, uh, in which 50 people were arrested on uh, charges of fraud and political violence was also you know, widespread. There were more than uh, 270 lives lost just in uh, this election alone. Uh, so things were not smooth as far as even you know, the electoral process is concerned. And with the reference to corruption, uh, you know, and there are also reports that the U.S. Uh, itself failed to confront a more distressing reality with reference to corruption. Uh, one of the authors who has done extensive research on this, uh, Gerd Berthold, he talked about, you know, that during 2010 and 12, uh, 3,000 uh, uh, of Defense Department, uh, you can say, contracts worth 106 billion. Uh, they went to mostly these, you know, warlords or most corrupt, you know, government uh, elites and so on in Afghanistan. So in many ways, you know, the, this aid, these contracts, they benefited the corrupt and not really went to people who needed that money. And the poverty was quite significant. There was unemployment in Afghanistan, one of the highest as well. And now, since the Taliban's takeover, you can see that they went to this vice president's house and they found close to six billion uh, million dollars and a lot of gold bars in his uh, house and so on. You can say that maybe they're doing their propaganda, but still uh, the reports of corruption from independent sources also talked about that. And then I think the, uh, the whole topic of why the Afghan National Army didn't pose any serious resistance, resistance to the Taliban's rise. This deserves more attention because, you know, they were well paid. Uh, the U.S. itself invested 80 billion dollars into the Afghan National Army. Um, so what went wrong? I think it was uh, how the Ashraf Ghani, government, uh, Ashraf Ghani government dealt with the Afghan National Army. Their army chief was just changed weeks ago, uh, all of that. And there was a lot of internal chaos and in, uh, dissatisfaction with the government within the Afghan National Army. And now to the issue of whether we have Taliban 2.0 or not. Uh, I would say not really, uh, similar to what Professor Rahman also talked about, but I'll talk about some uh, different dynamics and not relating to, of course, you know, human rights and so on, but others in general to talk about how they have slightly changed 
um, but not completely change in terms of their ideology and how they are going to implement Sharia. So with reference to, uh, I think Taliban uh, or Islamic Emirate of today, how they are different, I think their diplomatic uh, linkages have played a role in this, their office in Doha and their international exposure for their selected leadership, not all the Talibs. 99% uh, of them still, uh, they were uh, engaged in guerrilla warfare and so on. So in terms of their diplomatic outreach, and perhaps they learned from the 90s that they had to diversify their diplomatic linkages because in the past, they were mainly dependent on Pakistan and they were recognized by the UAE and Saudi Arabia. This time around, they want more countries to recognize them. Okay, so this is their uh, one of their agendas and they have already have diplomatic linkages with Russia, China, Iran, um, Qatar, and of course, Pakistan, and their embassies are still fully functional in, in Kabul as, as we speak. And in fact, Pakistan's embassy was working 24 seven in, in recent weeks. Um, so this is, I think they have learned, but uh, again, they are not helping their international supporters by not being inclusive. Uh, I think uh, these, their uh, countries like Pakistan, they're very frustrated that the Taliban didn't listen to them in terms of creating an inclusive government. The government, as Professor Rahman also talked about, a 33 member interim government has only uh, three non-Pashtun members, including two Tajiks and one Uzbek. Then it, that in itself is not an inclusive government. It leaves out other ethnic groups, mainly uh, Shia Hazaras. Um, and as of now, of course, they are showing that the girls are going to their schools. Uh, there is, of course, gender segregation in universities in terms of uh, boys and girls sitting in the same classrooms with curtains in the middle. Um, so they are showing that they have changed, but uh, not really because there are also reports coming of you know the, them torturing some women protesters and some journalists. There have been attacks on Hazara Shias as well. Um, and now, finally, before I conclude, I think it's important to think about how their behavior can be changed, if at all. Okay, so who has the leverage and who can play a role in this? So in terms of the implementation of Sharia, they, of course, look uh, towards the Arab world as a model. And I think their understanding of the Arab world is somewhere stopped in the 90s. And the Arab world itself has moved on. Even if you look at Saudi Arabia, they, now women can drive there. They, they are trying to modernize. So the Taliban's goalpost has shifted already. Uh, and the international community, if you look at the French foreign minister who went to uh, Doha recently, the key point they wanted to discuss was, or, the, or they were trying to promote was that of Qatar taking a lead role in terms of changing the Taliban's behavior or the mindset of the Taliban in terms of, because in the Gulf countries, you know, women, uh, play an active role in terms of uh, you know, uh, their involvement in different uh, uh, job sectors and so on. So they're trying to promote that, they're trying to use Qatar and the UAE, uh, these modern Gulf countries to convince the Taliban. And I think that's an important opportunity. If they will be left alone, as was the case in the 90s, I think the vacuum will again create and it will give rise to uh, extremism and terrorism that can also spill over across borders. Already countries, even uh, Afghanistan's neighbor, even Pakistan has shared concerns, China, uh, and as far as Bangladesh and India, they all have shared concerns that how this can directly contribute to extremism and terrorism and indirectly can also inspire Islamists in those countries and can lead to uh, much bigger problems uh, for the region and the international community. So I'll just stop here and then perhaps we can take some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sahid, also for um, taking up all the, the developments um, and also putting them into an international uh, context here. I just wanted to mention um, before we go into the discussion uh, that we do not have a chat as such in this type of uh, webinar um, format, but there is the Q&A function. So for our audience members, if you'd like uh, to ask a question, you can use that tool and uh, type in your question there. Uh, and indeed, we do already have um, a couple of questions um, coming in here for our panelists. Um, so uh, I would like 
Uh, to begin with the first uh, question that has come in, which is for um, uh, Professor Rehman. Um, how uh, does the antagonism between the Taliban and ISIS and the division within the Taliban, how could this impact uh, minorities and uh, religious minorities, in your view? Um, okay, thank you. Um, that's a very good question. Now, there is a clear uh, antagonism between Taliban and ISIS on, on how they interpret sh uh, Sharia and what is their worldview. For example, ISIS would, would have, a, you know, capturing the world and global con conquest. But that is not the position of Taliban. They won't have control um, over Afghanistan and they want, you know, the world to recognize them. So there is a fundamental uh, difference. And as I mentioned in my presentation, the Taliban have stated uh, quite explicitly and also as part of the Doha agreement that they would not allow uh, Afghanistan to be treated uh, as a territory where there are you know, plots of terrorism and terrorism is hatched against other countries. But that said, there are certain commonalities and there are certain issues which face the Taliban. One is we are not very clear about the extent to which they are themselves a unified force. And I think Zahid has already uh, kind of made reference. But, uh, you know, it, to, to imagine the Taliban is a very organized, cohesive force, I think uh, is, is not the, the correct interpretation. There are divisions, there are factions within Taliban, and there are many splinter groups of Taliban. And um, again, the point is that, you know, once the Taliban came into power, many of their proxies have also become active. So um, there is that uh, that real concerns which somehow aligns to ISIS. So ISIS may take strength, although they're not part of the system, but they may take strength from the, from the achievements in that sense of the Taliban or the conquest. Um, uh, and on some issues, there are also, you know, um, although they have, they have differences, but they have common enemies, you see. For example, if you look at the Shia, the treatment of Shia, the ISIS have been brutal and intolerant towards Shia, and so have the Taliban been. ISIS also have an ideology of repressing minorities, you know, religious minorities or ethnic minorities, and so have Taliban. Um, ISIS have also been very repressive, and, and in their own mind, the imposition of a moral, religious moral code, uh, and so have been so Taliban have a similar view. So while they disagree on so many points, there are also commonalities, and that is the real danger that you know extremist groups such as ISIS may take uh, encouragement from this unfortunate conquest of Taliban. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much um, for for your answer here. I think this is also something that the international community um, will have to be very concerned about in, in future um, in regards to developments. Um, we have also a second question that has come in, uh, which is um, to both our, our panelists. And uh, the question would be, can the international community engage uh, with the Taliban without legitimizing them? Or uh, even should they be um, legitimized? So uh, maybe, uh, Zahid, you can start with this question. You know, this is a million dollar question. You know, everyone is thinking about this, all the states, even countries that have very close relationship with the Taliban, they are also double minded because you know, to begin with, all these neighbors like Pakistan, China, Iran, and, and Russia and Central Asian republics, they were all on the same page with reference to the US, US Taliban peace deal. They wanted US troops to leave, but now everyone is worried about the spillover. So they're double minded. And also to directly answer this question, the problem is if the, you know, the Taliban's new setup is recognized or the Taliban led Islamic Emirate is recognized. The problem is perhaps that's your only card. And if the international community uses that without talking about you know, human rights, minority rights, or how Sharia will be implemented, perhaps they will lose that card too quickly. Perhaps, uh, in my opinion, they need to think very carefully. They need to think of this regional approach that Pakistan and other countries have been talking about 
in terms of dealing with Afghanistan, you know, once that kind of a setup is in place and there are countries willing to play a big role with regard to influencing uh, the Taliban or Islamic Emirate, then perhaps, you know, I think the next step could be taken with reference to recognizing this new setup uh, in Afghanistan. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I think, again, this is a difficult question. Um, now, the answer to that is that the international community is already engaging with Taliban and have engaged uh, for, for some time. Uh, and the international community may not have a choice but to engage in one form or another. For example, if there is a humanitarian uh, disaster, the refugee outflow, uh, you know, mass violations of human rights. So the international community has to react. So what I would say is that the international community must engage with the Taliban because they are de facto in control. Um, you know, legitimacy is quite another issue, and I would not uh, say that the international community should recognize Taliban. I, I'm against uh, the use of force and the, the, the way they have uh, occupied by force a country. Uh, there should be an absolute commitment to uh, international agreements, as the 2004 constitutions said quite explicitly. So um, the United Nations Charter, uh, the international um, human rights treaties to which Afghanistan is a party and um, other international agreements which the new administration must respect. Um, that should be a precondition for any form of financial or economic assistance because Taliban need that. They have said it quite explicitly. They say they want international uh, support but that should not be delivered without any preconditions and we should not allow the Taliban to actually uh, go back to their same old habits and be repressive and intolerant and, and have no framework of any democratic, inclusive um, uh, platform or framework. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe as a, as a quick um, follow up question to this that um, I gathered from from both of your presentations um, that the role of the international community that it has played um, so far in Afghanistan has not been a very successful one. So um, besides the, the talk of legitimacy and, and engaging with the Taliban, uh, what uh, do both of you think could be a, a way in, in supporting uh, minorities uh, right now in, with a very Im immediate uh, effect in, in this ongoing struggle that they are now facing? Uh, maybe Zahid, if you would like to go first. Thank you. I think to, to begin with, and this is already happening, you know, people who uh, are in danger, you know, especially minorities also even Afghan Pashtuns uh, who worked with international troops or NATO troops and different roles as, as interpreters and so on. So, uh, of course, similar uh, to the case of you know, Australia, other countries like UK, Canada, the US, they have issued visas to those people. But in the, in the manner in which the troops were withdrawn, there was a lot of chaos and there are so many people still left behind. And, and they are desperate to cross borders. I was just reading about you know, some more people trying to cross border into Afghanistan and the Taliban, they did not allow them to do that. Uh, uh, and I was helping uh, an Afghan couple who uh, who was in Pakistan, but they came through not the airport. So they didn't they didn't have their, you know, like entry stamp for Pakistan. So they couldn't leave the country. So I had to you know talk to some some of my friends and, and our PhD student here at Deakin University the civil servant and she helped in the whole process and finally the couple is in Switzerland. Um, so I think to begin with this is a short-term solution. Of course this is not a long-term solution because we are talking about thousands and thousands of more people. We have already seen that the international community, especially the developed world, has very little appetite to accept refugees. Most of the refugees are still uh, living in the developing world, still you know in neighboring countries like Pakistan and Iran in the case of Afghan refugees, and they are also not willing to take more refugees. So what can we do in this situation is to, I think, work with these countries to at least create, you know, openings for uh, religious minorities and ethnic minorities, because that's one way to save them. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thank you. I, I would uh, echo that. And I would say that um, the solution to this uh, Afghan crisis is not taking in more refugees. Uh, you, you, you can't take the whole of the country. Afghanistan um, has so many million people who need support. There are women, men, uh, ethnic and religious minorities, but all of the Afghans, they need a better life, you see. Um, I think uh, we need to uh, focus on Afghanistan. Uh, I think there was a problem that in, when the, in the last time when, uh, when the Taliban took over, the world was not really engaged with the Taliban. Um, from 1996 to 2001, there were a lot of atrocities that took place, but it did not receive the attention that it should have. The world community did not react in the way it did un, un, until the events of 9-11. We should not repeat that. I think um, Afghanistan is an important country geographically, strategically, and importantly, from a human rights point of view. We should focus on Afghanistan more. It should be now with the, with the disaster that we are facing. It should be the world's attention. I think uh, that there should be a continuous engagement. We have to ask ourselves the questions what, ha what has the international community done in the past two decades and where are the fault lines? We must overcome these difficulties and try to become engaged with the forces that are in control and try and bring back a measure of uh, inclusiveness, a measure of human rights, a measure of uh, you know, values that are uh, common to humanity. And it, I think this argument is, is not a is not a persuasive one that okay because we believe in sharia we are going to deviate from human rights norms there are so many countries i mean oic has 57 countries and there are there is an absolute commitment from most of these countries that they would respect human rights law notwithstanding they're also commit they're, they're being committed to sharia so uh, i don't think we should accept any arguments based on sharia human rights law and international law should be the framework of reference in negotiations with, uh, with the Afghan Taliban. And we should expect and we should encourage uh, the Taliban to actually uh, come up with a solution of a more inclusive uh, human rights oriented approach rather than saying, OK, this is what it is and we are not going to follow human rights. So it's important that we work with them without recognizing them work with them and make sure that there is a, a there is a governance structure which over time respects human rights minority rights and rights of religious groups thank you yeah thank you very much i think it's it's very important um that you are uh, both highlighting this dialogue um orientation so that uh, indeed we should also keep our focus of the international community on Afghanistan and this will of course also be an important uh, measure then in uh, besides the financial aid and conditionality in, in also uh, keeping uh, an eye on the Taliban and, and what they are doing uh, in uh, this country. Um, so we have a couple um, further questions. Uh, we've now talked about uh, the um, the current situation or um, how uh, to deal uh, with the Taliban being back in power. Um, there is now another question about uh, uh, Taliban, uh, the resistance to the Taliban, uh, which goes to uh, Saheed. So uh, the question is um, whether there is any news about uh, the Mujahideen defense in the Panjshir Valley. Uh, because there have been contradicting news reports uh, published over the last days uh, regarding the situation there. So the question is whether you could give us an, an update on uh, what is going on in this particular part. With reference to Panjshir, I think, you know, like we all have seen in the past couple of weeks, it's, you know, uh, most of the news coming through is, is fake news. And unfortunately, a lot of propaganda uh, and this is also incorrect that there is again, you know, this uh, uh, resistance there. I think the Taliban have actually won, uh, or you can say that crushed the resistance there. But with reference to fake news, you know, that's not very unusual. Uh, that there's there's so much of fake news coming through. There was news of, for example, one Pakistani uh, soldier dying there. In fact, he's Pakistan's uh, TV show host. 
uh, whose picture was posted uh, uh, by an Afghan journalist on social media and so on, and with reference to Pakistan's involvement, I think they showed F-15 flying over and they said it's Pakistani plane, but in the end it was, uh, I think, British or American plane somewhere in Wales. So unfortunately, as the situation is evolving, uh, we see that, you know, how different actors are using social media for their own propaganda. And same is the case here with reference to now more news coming up that there is, you know, still that resistance is alive in Panjshir. Um, you know, I haven't heard that from any credible source, so I won't believe it. Thank you very much for the, the assessment um, of the situation there. Uh, now, as we are um, coming quite uh, close to, to the end um, of our webinar time, um, there is another question on uh, the regard of um, scholars uh, in Afghanistan, which uh, goes to, to both. Um, to both panelists, so how universities and academia um, could support minority scholars from Afghanistan um, to pursue their education and also um, to be rescued from being uh, targeted uh, by um, the Taliban. Maybe, uh, Javid, if you'd like to go first on this. Yeah, thank you. I think it's, it's really important uh, that at an individual level, at an institutional level and at, uh, as we've discussed, international community and at, uh, you know, various levels within the international community, we lend uh, a hand of support to the Afghan people. Um, so that's the first point. The second point is how do uh, academic scholars and institutions support them? I think there are many avenues of support. Sometimes uh, we have in the past um, had students, uh, collaborators, researchers, who have worked with us and have gone back. So let us make an effort to reconnect them. I mean, I have had many students, I, I still have many students from Afghanistan. Uh, I'm trying my best to connect to them to see what their needs are. Um, some of them uh, have uh, been able to leave the country, but there are many others who have not. And the situation, uh, you know, it, it it's a crisis, but the crisis does will not remain a crisis. It will somehow over time, you know, we we will move on, and their lives will will be there, and and their lives will be in a form of a, a crisis, but more stabilized. So we have to work within the circumstances that they are. We have to work with those institutions how we can assist their work. So, for example, on teaching and training and you know of learning uh, the the issues that they were doing so uh, as a human rights lawyer as an academic I, I should remain committed to supporting those colleagues and those institutions and perhaps you know uh, avenues where we can actually do some teaching for them or uh, you know providing them in, with information or connecting them with uh, international human rights organizations the civil society so that we can better highlight this situation. And then, of course, all the things that we are talking about, engagement with the current administration, uh, that can be avenues of engaging with the Taliban leaders. And, and we have to remember the Taliban are also individuals. They, they, they have to be addressed. We need to somehow talk to them. And we must find avenues. I mean, we, we have to, as human rights defenders or women's rights defenders, we have to engage and confront them and say, that this is not allowed, their perception of uh, Sharia law is unacceptable. So I think we have to engage in a form of a dialogue, uh, even with the Taliban, because these are the forces that we have to uh, be uh, confronted with. Thank you. You are on mute. Oh, sorry. Your take, Zahid. I was just going to give over to you. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, similar to what Professor Imam said, I think engagement is very important. And just like a couple of hours ago, I was in a, a seminar on Afghanistan from a, organized by a Pakistani university. And there I talked about, you know, how, of course, it's important to engage with the Taliban's leadership, especially the younger members who now will be, you know, playing different kinds of roles which countries can perhaps work with them uh, through different capacity building programs. We don't have to necessarily call them de-radicalization, 
uh, it could be just awareness raising, you know, leadership programs or something uh, to try to, uh, f first of all, establish that sort of uh, connection. And secondly, to stand a chance of changing their behavior in future. And not specifically with, right, uh, with reference to minority rights scholars. I, I know that there are many governments who uh, have scholarship programs that, of course, prioritize uh, uh, ethnic and religious minorities. A lot of Hazaras came on, for example, those scholarships to Australia and so on. But the pandemic has actually made everything much worse. You know, although there are scholarships, but the borders are closed in many countries. So these, you know, people now, for example, in Australia, many universities have asked academics to take only domestic students because international students cannot come that easily. So it has, you know, posed that another additional challenge in terms of actually uh, bringing those young uh, minority rights scholars over to, let's say, Western universities for their PhDs and postdocs and so on. So there's that challenge, of course, but that won't remain there forever. Uh, let us be hopeful. And I think it's, it's time that we engage with them. We all have our individual responsibilities. We should check on our contacts in Afghanistan you know, how are they, you know, like, for example, what kind of challenges they are facing and to find ways uh, to also help them. Maybe there are many who have lost jobs, you know, like, and then and so on. So there are little things we can do and also big things in terms of, you know, helping them maybe uh, find some other kind of uh, jobs or to move to other countries if needed. Thank you for your uh, assessment regarding this question. Now we have um, quite a few questions still left, but unfortunately um, we are running out of time. So with three minutes left, um, goes to show that this is a topic that uh, we could probably discuss for hours and hours uh, about, and uh, that there is a lot um, of interest and a lot of willingness um, to, to learn also, um, as we've seen from the many interesting questions our participants have posed uh, here today. So um, just as a final, um, very quick final wrap up question, um, I would like to ask both of you to, to give a short uh, look into the future. So what do you see ahead for Afghanistan, for minorities in Afghanistan um, over the, the next um, couple of years? And uh, which role do you think the international community can play and should play um, in this development? Um, maybe uh, Javid first. Um, thank you. Yeah, again, that's, uh, you know, this is an important but challenging question, how the situation will unravel. Um, I think that uh, the international community, insofar as we are concerned as part of international community, we have to retain a focus, as, I, as I've said. Um, what has happened has happened, but we need to make sure that the fundamental rights and the rights of women and minorities are somehow um, you know, protected, and we 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 hold uh, the current Taliban's to account. You know, I, I think there is uh, a lot more international focus and a lot more international attention. But we should not allow this to slip. You know, because what happened in 1996 was that there was some attention, but not uh, for too long. And right now there is attention, but um, it may just not be there next month. So we have to retain a focus. We have to engage consistently with the people of Afghanistan. We have to have a dialogue. We have to see what we can do. We, we have to exert pressure. As I said, the Taliban want recognition, but that should not come without um, any uh, human rights issues uh, brought to table. And I think that a consistent engagement in the coming months and some kind of dialogue and, uh, and assurances of of a form of inclusive government, of a form of reform in human rights and minority rights would be uh, a first step. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Javid. Um, now for Sahid for your uh, last take on this. You know, I want to be optimistic still, although you know, the situation might not be that optimistic for the people who are living in Afghanistan. But in terms of options, against, uh, again, I would say that engagement has won. Um, you know, I often give the example of how the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, by when they suspended Syria's membership, they also shut all the doors of engagement with the, the Assad regime. 
Uh, so we should learn from lessons. And I think here uh, in Afghanistan, uh, an important lesson is that this engagement should continue because the Taliban, they also want to show to the world that they have changed, okay? That they are Taliban 2.0. Uh, they want girls to uh, go to colleges and universities and women to you know, uh, be engaged in the job market and so on. So I think these are important sort of opportunities that the international community has to benefit from. And also they want to show that the situation is very normal. At the time being, for the time being, the neighbors are helping them and showing that the situation is normal, their embassies are working and the trade is happening in normal and, uh, and so on. So this also shows that they want to show to the people in Afghanistan that the country is safe. Everything is normal. They can stay there. They don't have to just be desperate about leaving the country. So I think this is the opportunity that the international community should fully grab onto and start its engagement. Um, and in this regard, I must say that the Taliban should keep their office in Doha open because that will continue to play an important role in terms of international communities' engagement with the Islamic Emirate. Thanks a lot uh, for these final uh, these final assessments of the situation. So indeed, uh, this also gives us as uh, the international um, academics uh, and the international community that is working um, on the topic of Afghanistan also a quite um, challenging and important role in this in in keeping our eyes and ears open into what is going on there and into being watchful of the situation and keeping it um, also as far as is in our power uh, on the international agenda. Thank you very much to both our speakers today, to Professor Rahman and to Dr. Ahmed. And uh, thank you for taking the time to sharing your expertise uh, here with us. And of course, thank you also to all the colleagues that were involved in uh, organizing this webinar. And uh, last but not least, to our uh, audience members and uh, their very interesting and challenging questions. That is it uh, from us, and thank you all very much for participating. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you.